All right, everybody, uh, welcome back. So in the next 45 minutes, um, we'll have a fireside chat with uh, Marshall Hebert. As Ritwick put it, the one and only Marshall Hebert. So Marshall is a professor of robotics and dean of School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon. His research interests include computer vision and robotics, especially recognition in images um, and video data, um, model building and object recognition from 3D data and perception for mobile robots and for intelligent vehicles. Uh, his group has developed approaches for object recognition and scene analysis in uh, images, 3D point clouds, and video sequences. In the area of machine uh, perception for robotics, his group and he, uh, has developed techniques for people detection, tracking, and prediction, and for understanding um, the environment of ground vehicles from sensor data. He currently also serves as editor in chief in an international journal of computer vision. So uh, now he will give us uh, first give us an overview of some challenges and pro uh, challenging projects at School of Computer Science that deal with complex uh, complex data, and then we will open up the floor to have a um, audience ask some questions and we'll have a uh, informal conversation. So Marshall. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. Uh, yes, yeah, so I thought I would share with you a couple of um, challenges uh, that we are exploring in uh, using and reusing uh, data. Uh, and I'll talk about you know three areas that I think are uh, interesting. Those are not the only three areas, but I thought I'd point out those three areas just to get started with the conversation. Uh, and I'll illustrate those three areas with uh, research that we're doing here. Uh, in the School of Computer Science. So the, the first area has to do with uh, the nature of one particular type of data uh, that is becoming increasingly important and uh, requires kind of new tools and new way of thinking about the data. And that's uh, what I call, I have to find maybe a better name for it, uh, let's call it uh, human generated uh, data. Uh, so those are things that involve um, uh, data from uh, human evaluations, uh, ratings, reports, surveys, things like that. And the problem with that data is that it is typically uh, very noisy by, by definition, because uh, we people are very, uh, you know, uh, noisy and disorganized in our thinking, uh, uncertain, it's incomplete, uh, it's very biased because we all are uh, biased in, in a variety of, of ways. Uh, so that makes it very uh, challenging to deal with this uh, data. And, and those are, you know, a few examples of, of those things. You know, you can have, uh, you know, satisfaction surveys, uh, various types of uh, evaluation, uh, various types of uh, human ratings. So, for example, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk is one way to uh, collect uh, that kind of data on a very large, uh, on a very large scale. Uh, and in fact, if you look at all the potential application, it goes across the board in uh, all the application you can think of, um, you know, including uh, healthcare, uh, various product trading, uh, even in things that do affect uh, decision, uh, that decisions um, that could have far-reaching consequences in terms of bias and equity, like uh, admissions and hiring. Um, and of course, various data is from, uh, from crowd, uh, crowdsourcing. So again, this, this is a different type of data than what you think uh, typically about when you think about laboratory data or scientific uh, data. And the problem again, is that to be able to really handle that data, one needs to have a deep understanding of human behavior, psychology, social sciences, uh, et cetera. Uh, this is, by the way, those are examples from the work of Nihar Shah in the uh, machine learning uh, department who specializes in this, um, in this uh, um, uh, aspect of the, of the research. So this is, this is a, a, an illustrative example here. Uh, and again, this is on one particular application, which is uh, probably um, uh, important for many people here on this call, which is peer reviews of, of papers, right? Um, and if you look at the data from peer reviewing of paper, by definition, it's going to be extremely uh, subjective. So you have to now uh, normalize the uh, uh, processing of that data 
based on the model of that of that subjectivity. Uh, it's biased. Uh, people have, uh, and we know that, uh, readers have uh, different biases based on uh, the origin of the papers and, and, and so forth of the topic and, and so forth. Um, uh, miscalibration, and this is, uh, of course, the <laughs> well-known uh, issue with uh, human raters, that we all have a different internal scale. How to calibrate those scales is another, another issue. Uh, and finally, noisy, you know, uh, there's uh, uh, a number of uh, reviewers may not be qualified, there's noise in the data and, and so forth. So those are the kind of, of things that are not um, uh, uh, as are not as directly characterizable as in uh, other types of scientific data that require, again, uh, a deeper understanding of uh, human behavior, human uh, thinking, uh, societal aspects, and, and so far, so and so forth. So here are some of the things that, that need to be done there is to uh, design a new algorithm for, for fairness, uh, perhaps design those new algorithm in a way that uh, rigorous uh, mathematical guarantees can be uh, derived, which is uh, very difficult, something that is possible for other kinds of data where you can have some strong uh, statistical uh, guarantees, some strong test of, of fairness of data, for example, which is very difficult in those, in, in those cases. Um, as I mentioned, uh, reaching out very far from what we think typically as data science into uh, psychology and economics and social science, et cetera, to be able to deal with that data. And finally, uh, deployment at scale. The at scale being, of course, uh, the issue in, in doing this. So that was just a quick mention of that, that first kind of challenge, how to deal with that, that kind of uh, human-generated data, human-generated evaluation data. Uh, at scale and with formal uh, formal tools. So that's one, one aspect. Um, of course, another aspect when we talk about data is that we want to uh, be able to process the data or use the data uh, in a way that guarantees uh, privacy and security. And when I mean privacy, I don't mean just uh, uh, privacy of say uh, human subjects, um, you know, which is uh, of course uh, an obvious uh, issue, uh, but also uh, privacy to protect perhaps uh, how the data was acquired or some uh, other uh, knowledge about the data that needs to be, uh, that needs to be protected. Uh, this is particularly important in reusing the data because um, reuse of the data is often uh, prevented by uh, various aspects of the data that need to be uh, preserved, preserved and remain private. So how to use the data while retaining privacy of some uh, aspects of the data is another, of course, another major issue. So <clears throat> there's a few ways that this uh, can be done. Uh, one could imagine uh, outsourcing the, um, sorry, <clears throat> outsourcing the uh, processing of the data to, to the cloud, or one could imagine uh, instead of that, having a uh, collaborative uh, computation, meaning uh, distributing that, that computation, that use of the data to a different agent for different types of, of uh, privacy. Um, so there's two, two major techniques that one can, can use for this. Uh, one is uh, what is called uh, enclaves, which is basically creating basically a box uh, that is uh, secure within which that, that processing can take place. Uh, a second approach is to say, well, I'm not going to have that, that box that's secure, but I'm going to have the, uh, the way the data is distributed and, and shared to be secure, basically using uh, um, on, uh, 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 encoded uh, protocol, cryptographic pr uh, protocol to share, that, uh, to share the, the, the data. Uh, and by the way, those examples are from the work of uh, Wenting Zane's group. Uh, in uh, the School of Computer Science. Uh, so those, this is just an illustration of what we mean by um, an, an enclave, which is basically a, an environment that has a self-contained set of tools to do the uh, data processing so that the data can be isolated in that, uh, in that enclave. We can develop code within that, that enclave uh, and one uh, code on, on the data. Uh, in a secure fashion, meaning completely isolated from the, uh, from the uh, outside. 
Uh, so some of the research issues uh, uh, here is to be able to support the wide range, uh, a wide enough range of uh, functionalities so that we can do uh, a rich enough processing on the data and also to uh, protect uh, against uh, external uh, access uh, doing this. Uh, the other uh, option, of course, is to uh, do the, uh, the um, uh, cryptographic uh, uh, sharing of, of data. This is, again, an example uh, from uh, Wenting Zain. This is a system called uh, Helen, uh, which basically uh, develop a specialized uh, protocol to be able to share data securely across different agents. Now, the, the, the main issue here is to be able to do this within a reasonable amount of time. Uh, we know very well how to uh, encode data securely and to share data securely. The problem is to be able to do this uh, in a way that is um, efficient from a, a computational uh, standpoint that, that can scale to a large number of samples. So that's a key uh, research issue that's being addressed uh, here. And again, the reason for looking at those res research issues is to be able to uh, use data in a variety of modes from completely open to uh, uh, having uh, aspects of the data that are kept private throughout the entire computation on, on the data. Uh, the latter being again, uh, particularly important for uh, reused, uh, reuse aspects where uh, some of the uh, aspects of the data must be, uh, must be protected. Uh, so, Moving a little bit further on this, uh, on this uh, um, idea of distributing the, uh, the computation, uh, we can look at uh, ideas in using data in a completely distributed way. Uh, so a, a typical um, a centralized view of a machine learning, for example, would say, well, send all the data to a centralized location, run some learning algorithm, uh, in this um, central location and output uh, produce, produce the output, let's call it, let's call it W. Uh, an alternate uh, view of that would say, well, I don't want to share that data. I don't want to, because some of that data needs to remain private. Uh, so I'm going to do some computation locally, uh, and that's illustrated here by those nodes in that, in that graph. And I'm going to somehow gather the output of that computation to, uh, to generate my final output. Uh, again, important for any use of, of, of data uh, when we want to keep some aspects of that data uh, private. Um, there are many examples of this. You can, you can think of um, uh, medical data, for example, that needs to uh, remain uh, private, but that you can learn intermediate results that can be uh, transmitted. Uh, computation at the edge on uh, on uh, personal uh, devices, phones, watches, and so forth, or home uh, devices. So the idea here is to be able to address this issue of privacy by doing a uh, massively distributed uh, processing of the, uh, of the data, uh, and to then connect those nodes together in a way that guarantees that, uh, that privacy, okay? Uh, this, the examples here, by the way, are the examples from uh, Amit Takawar and uh, Virginia Smith from, uh, from the machine learning, uh, machine learning department. So how, uh, uh, how far can we go in those ideas and still maintain uh, privacy? So this is, this is a graph, again, from uh, Amit and Virginia's uh, work uh, that show for particular tasks, it's not terribly important what the task is, it's a classification uh, task, but uh, it basically shows the uh, accuracy as a function of the number of, of samples in a, in a learning task. Uh, the, this graph is with non-private learning, meaning no attention is paid to keeping any data uh, separate or, or private. Now, state of the art, uh, which is standard differential, uh, differentially private learning, uh, is, is this bottom curve. So we basically, as soon as we try to enforce some kind of uh, privacy in, in a standard setup, we see a massive drop in, in accuracy, okay? Uh, in this case, about a factor of almost uh, four in the, uh, in the accuracy. And now if you uh, do the kind of uh, approaches that they're suggesting, you can go back to something that is close to 
the, uh, the uh, non-private uh, learning approach, okay? Uh, so this is basically a long-winded explanation to say that uh, there's a lot of opportunities uh, in this uh, research in developing new ways of thinking about how to process the data, how to protect privacy to a much higher degree uh, than, was, uh, than was possible uh, before. And again, by privacy does not mean just privacy of subjects, but uh, privacy of various um, uh, facets of the, of the data, if you, if you will. Okay, um, and, and the third thing, and that's the, the last one, don't worry, I'm not going to uh, talk very long. Uh, the last one is, is something that we call uh, version, versioning. I have to learn how to uh, pronounce that word, versioning. Um, and and the, idea, the idea is this, uh, if you have, in many applications, you have data that, that evolves over time, in fact, in most uh, applications, actually. And so, so for example, in uh, autonomous navigation, uh, you're going to, typical data, you're going to uh, record a stream of images of distances and, and velocity. Uh, and in many situations where you record data over time, uh, the initial measurements are only uh, provisional and they may be later replaced and refined with more accurate version. Uh, a process that can repeat multiple times. So the data can actually be updated. The data in the past can actually be updated um, multiple times. So for example, in uh, econometry, uh, we rely on measurements of prices and wages and uh, employment levels, et cetera. For those values, provisional values are first available within weeks, but then they get repeatedly updated for several quarters after that, right? So you have different versions of the data all the time. You have the data that you get now, and then later on, two quarters later, you have the same the data that was there that is now re-evaluated based on what we know now, okay? So you have basically an evolving uh, uh, set of, of data. Uh, so the problem uh, with, with this, the challenge, is that when such, uh, when this kind of technology is applied in, in real time, only the provisional estimates are available for the most recent indicator, okay? And the problem then is that uh, statistical and machine learning models must be very carefully trained with the right version uh, of the data, right? Um, so the, in the provisional uh, records are a part of that, uh, of that data, right? So for, from a data technology perspective, we must develop ways to uh, record, organize, and serve various versions of each quantity of interest. So it, one way to think about it is that we need to move from, from what do we know to what did we know and when did we know it? Uh, this is what we call data versioning, because now we have multiple versions of the data that need to be maintained. Uh, from a reuse standpoint, that means that we need to understand not only uh, how the data was obtained, uh, but also when the data was obtained and which version of the data we, we are uh, looking at. And the process of versioning, versioning must, be, must be understood uh, as well. Um, this is an example that I uh, take from uh, the work of Ryan uh, Tishibari and um, Ronnie Rosenfeld. Uh, they lead the uh, Delphi project, which is basically a large project on um, uh, building models that are predictive of COVID uh, propagation and trying to build models that are the level of uh, individual zip code that uh, maybe have uh, a long uh, time horizon. This is an example here of the interface uh, that shows some of the uh, 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 status of COVID cases across across the country. So of course, the way they do this is by accumulating a, a large amount of data, many different sources of data from doctor's visit, uh, self-reporting on Facebook, Google, other platforms, um, uh, very heterogeneous data, uh, uh, of course, that has to be uh, acquired continuously uh, over time, all right? Uh, and if you look at how this data works, uh, you have kind of a two-dimensional axis, right? You have the time at which the data is reported in this little example here from time t to uh, time t minus four in the past, okay? And then you have the uh, 
the time uh, during which you're trying to make a prediction. So uh, what happens here is that the, um, the data is, is reported at a certain time, so t minus four here at the bottom. Then at the next uh, time of reporting, that new data at t minus three is going to change this data at t minus four. Perhaps we're going to realize that we had actually more uh, reports, more COVID cases or more uh, COVID motivated uh, doctors visit at t minus four uh, than we thought as being corrected from the, from the new reports. Okay, uh, and this happens consistently, right? This happens uh, because of delayed reports. This happens because of error correction. Uh, this happens for, for a number of, 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 of uh, reasons. Uh, and the uh, experience here is that taking this properly into account is absolutely critical to be able to build uh, any kind of accurate uh, model. So you can, if you look at this diagram, you can see that you, you now don't have just uh, uh, one linear set of data uh, acquired over time. You now have kind of a two-dimensional graph of data with the multiple versions of the data. And understanding this, this versioning process and how the data has changed is actually critical in being able to build those models. So how does one represent that? How does one store and manage that data? How does one represent how this versioning takes place is, is a, um, an interesting uh, set of issues in, in modern data. Uh, this is an example here. I'm going to try to see if I can do this. Yeah. Uh, this is an example uh, here of uh, data on the horizontal axis is time. This is a, a, a doctor's visit that are reported. Uh, and the vertical axis is the number of uh, doctor's, uh, doctor's visit. Okay. Uh, the uh, interesting thing is that the, uh, I cannot get my pointer to work here, sorry. So the, uh, um, the orange uh, bars here are the uh, visit uh, reported uh, up to the uh, 8th of April. And the other colors indicate visits reported in uh, the few uh, days after that. So uh, 10, 14, and 17 in the, in the upper graph. Uh, the point here is that the data back in time is changed based on the current uh, on the current data. That's what is illustrated on the right side of that graph that you see at the top uh, here. Uh, so this is just a graphical uh, visualization on actual data. Uh, for this particular COVID uh, prediction, COVID tracking um, uh, project of what it means to have those multiple version of the data that one can, uh, needs to keep on. So again, uh, this is a relatively simple example on a, a, a one number graph like this. The problem now is how to do this in a systematic way with systematic tools on uh, uh, heterogeneous uh, data. So, those were a couple of uh, things that I wanted to uh, mention. You know, the idea of uh, human generated data and uh, all the new tools that that, that, that requires, uh, privacy and, and security and uh, paving the way for completely distributed and secure uh, data processing so that we can maintain uh, whatever um, uh, proprietary or private uh, nature of the data it is that we want to uh, protect while, while doing the processing that we need. And finally, versioning, which has to do with um, data that uh, evolves over time for which we need to uh, keep multiple, uh, multiple versions. So those are a couple of things that I wanted to, uh, to mention. And I will, uh, I will stop here and, and uh, give it back, give, it, give the floor back to you, Virgin. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Marshall. <clears throat> Thanks for the great overview of the activities that's um, happening at the School of Computer Science and all these uh, relevant questions that to uh, relate to data reuse. So now I would like to open the floor for the audience to ask questions. So you can either, since we have a manageable uh, size, I would say we can, uh, you can either raise your hands or uh, chat the questions to uh, me. So, Amit, you 
you can go ahead and mute your, unmute yourself. Uh, hey, uh, this is Amit from uh, Material Science Department. Uh, hi, Marshall. Uh, that's an excellent talk. I have a very specific question. Maybe it falls into what you show, maybe not, but I will just go ahead and ask. <laughs> So within the context of human generated data, you also showed that peer review process also have, can at times have a multiple way of representing the similar kind of uh, information. So given the ontological discussion, which we are having since morning, is it possible to extract some sense of what sort of ontology exists by training some sort of an NLP algorithms from the peer review journal articles itself. So coming, so I'm looking in a way, not the top-down approach of designing the ontology and then extracting information from the papers for, from a bottom-up perspective of developing an ontology schema by scanning thousands of papers. Any thoughts on this would be great. Yeah, that's, that's, that's an interesting, uh... <clears throat> That's an interesting idea, and uh, actually, some uh, things, some attempts like this are, are being done, uh, not necessarily in the context of, uh, not in the in the context of reviewing, uh, but in the context of uh, summarizing and in the context of uh, identifying trends, also, okay, uh, which uh, um, in, in those cases, you, you need to have a bottom-up uh, aspect. So I, I realize this is not the same as what you, you suggested in terms of the ontology definition, but the, the tools, the basic bottom-up tools that you would use are, are, are kind of the same, right? Uh, so that's, that would be an, inter an interesting uh, uh, thing to, to, to look at. Okay. Thank you. So any other questions from the audience? So we're having, like, this is sort of informal conversation between all of us. So um, please don't be shy and ask questions. Um, I guess I can just ask one question that always, um, always does very, uh, I always wonder about. So, you know, there are a lot of secondary data out there and there's like Marshall, you also have mentioned, so there's a lot of uh, human generated data and they're uh, messy and heterogeneous and hard to use. So uh, from your experience, like what would make you, like when you see a data set, what makes you to trust that uh, this data set is usable or at least manageable uh, before you actually download the whole thing? Yeah, so I think the, the key thing is to uh, have, um, formal data so, so the, the key thing is it's not the data it's the metadata okay that will uh -huh. say how that data was was acquired right that is that is the most important uh, the most important thing um you know as you mentioned in the uh, introduction i uh, come originally from uh, robotics uh and uh data sets are extremely important in in, in robotics as in any uh, field actually uh but one thing that is particularly difficult uh, is to uh, document exactly the conditions under which the data was, was acquired, especially when we talk about uh, physical data, you know, of uh, machines moving or interacting with the environment, right? Uh, so, so that's the main, the, main, uh, the main point, I think. How was the, the data uh, uh, collected? And by that, I don't mean just uh, statistical, um, you know, um, uh, characteristics of the data. You know, uh, um, you know, in terms of bias or things like this, it, it's it's more how the data was acquired, how it was transformed, and so forth. Um, one of the issues I, I think is uh, having formal ways of describing that, okay, uh, and formal ways of describing that that can be shared across domains. Okay, I, I think a lot of that is still uh, a bit of an art. Right, and it's still very much uh, data and domain uh, dependent. So it's it's difficult to have um, you know uh, um, common best practices, or even better, uh, common tools that would help describe how the, the that metadata. Yeah. 
So yeah, so metadata is the key. I guess like some of the many of the speakers in the uh, morning also mentioned like different um, implementing different uh, metadata schema. Um, I guess for the for for those in the audience, um, I also I kind of want to pose the question. We you know we are dealing with very like many all different kinds of data uh, schema and um, so. So I guess the, the question is when, when you're facing all these uh, data, uh, data schema, um, how do you choose which one to use and um, how to move forward from, is there any efforts in um, har uh, harmonizing all these standards? Okay, I don't see any response. <laughs> Well, yes, the answer, that means the answer is no, right? <laughs> that must I be suppose, yeah, I, I, yeah. My sense is that this is the a tough question for, uh, for most people to, uh, to answer. And if there's a, uh, I saw in the morning, there are some, uh, when Lily was talking about the dimensions data and um, I think Melissa suggested, okay, add this ontology to it. So um, if you, uh, so the audience, if you if you like uh, join the uh, conversation, please go to the Slack um, and uh, contribute to that thread. Um, so I guess the Marshall, ne the next question, I guess uh, from here, I also want to see that you know from university we generate a lot of a uh, lot of data from the sciences and from the uh, robotics as well, I guess, uh, but also from um, from uh, you know the domains and disciplines that are not traditionally uh, data heavy, like music, arts, and humanities, they're also generating a lot of data. And everybody wants to uh, use data and do some uh, sort of the AI is becoming more and more of a standard uh, application for these domains. So as a higher ed, uh, ed institution, how do you see our role um, in helping people to use all these data? Yeah, so one uh, major uh, direction that, that we need to pursue, that, that we are pursuing to some extent, uh, is the uh, taking all those ideas and being able to develop tools uh, that can be used uh, with minimal uh, knowledge of those, those, those issues. As you said, um, minimal expertise, to, to, to use a term I think that, that, that you use. Uh, and that involves actually uh, work research, not just in uh, data science and AI and related fields, uh, but also uh, work in uh, HCI um, and in uh, injecting in the conversation, uh, modeling of how one uses the data, right? Uh, this, is, this is similar to some work in software engineering, for example, that actually uh, uh, involves a lot of human modeling that has to do with how uh, people think about code, how people design uh, code, uh, you know, how people track down uh, uh, errors, do refinement and things like this. So we need to have um, similar models as to how people deal with data generally. So it's more, uh, it's kind of a, a strange thing that, that uh, to address the problem that you describing, you need the, the technical uh, work of, of building tools that are well engineered so, so we can lower the barrier to entry. But we also need uh, a lot of work that comes from more from the uh, uh, human studies and, and psychology and, and, and human behavior. Uh, and I'm a great believer that a, a lot of the progress that we're going to do in computer science related tools, so AI, etc., cetera, um, will come uh, not just from uh, technical progress in uh, computing related things, AI, et cetera, but will come from uh, better understanding and better modeling of, of human interaction. Uh, in this case, human interaction being how one goes about uh, using data but, uh, and interacting with data. Uh, so we have, we have a question from Keith. I guess, Keith, do you wanna just unmute yourself? Just done that watch in, thanks. Um, yeah, Marshall, thank you. Fascinating presentation as 
I expected. And you make me wonder about incentives for data sharing. And mm -hmm. we all know that apart from the um, shared criticism of car parking, that most faculty in a university are united by their discipline rather than by their institution. <laughs> and therefore I can imagine, for example, roboticists around the world sharing data with each other so that they can broaden the analysis and testing of models. But in many instances, I've seen or heard of effective reuse of data by people across disciplinary boundaries. My first and favorite example of that was when I worked in Australia and we had um, a zoologist tracking kangaroo movements and whose data turned out to be hugely important for climate scientists. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wonder about incentives at the institutional level and whether, as you, know, you and I will be gearing up for our promotion and tenure committees in a few weeks' time, should we be thinking about how we recognise a faculty member's sharing of their data and the reuse of that data as part of their career trajectory? Or are there other incentives we should be thinking about to encourage people taking on the creation of metadata, the proper um, curation and sharing of their materials? Yeah, that's a great question. And thank you for mentioning the parking too. I was wondering where you were going. <laughs> Somebody had to. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think I would, um, I would think in those terms uh, of the uh, evolution of uh, how research is evaluated. It used to be that research was evaluated, say, on journal papers, right? That was the uh, kind of the uh, the the the, the, uh, the the measuring rod, you know, of of, of uh, productivity. Uh, and then we went into more uh, other instruments of publication, which are not necessarily journal papers, but they are still publication. You know, they, they look like uh, articles and things like this. And then the next step was to go to, um, and again, I'm, I'm talking a little bit more in my world, but I think it applies across the board. We're talking more about, um, you know, software and, and things like this that can be released to the public uh, and that can be used and reused uh, by a, a large number and uh, in some cases, in the case of deep learning, in a large number of applications that are across, across the board. And then what we're seeing now is uh, in the uh, section, since you were using that metaphor of uh, reappointment and promotion, in, in that section, which is no longer called publication, but is called products, we now see more and more of data and data sets, okay? Uh, and the, uh, the measure of success for those uh, data set is uh, precisely what you said, is basically how widely is it used, how much of a reference uh, data set uh, is it, and more and more, uh, how broadly is it, is it used, okay? Uh, so I think that's the evolution, and that's the evolution that we see already, that, that uh, uh, a data set that is uh, uh, recognized as uh, you know, um, enabling new new work and, and new research is a metric as you know as powerful as you know publication or code or uh, other uh, artifacts. Um, and I think we're going to see uh, more and more of that uh, in, in in the future, uh, especially those that can be used, like you said, across many uh, many disciplines. Great, thank you. And I see that Huajin has put a couple of helpful links in the chat for those who want to explore these issues for. So this is a, um, oh yeah. So this is a link shared uh, by, um, sorry, I'm not, I'm sure I'm reading your name wrong. Mo Mo Ka? Would you like to say a few words about this a link you shared? From what I, uh, my understanding looks like this is one of the, yeah. Um, yeah, hello. Um, I just wanted to point to this uh, European project. It is funded by the European Commission, uh, one of uh, many uh, on establishing the European Open Science Cloud. And they have very good uh, deliverables, um, any aspects of um, uh, FAIR uh, data, 
and also facilitating implementation for repositories and uh, different stack other stakeholders. So. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so um, I don't see further questions from, oh, there's a one hand. Um, Ali, you could go ahead Hi. and unmute yourself. Yep. Yeah, um, you didn't see it because I just put it up there. So thanks for catching. Awesome, all right. <laughs> uh, this is a little more of a, a high level question and it's just something that I wonder about um, AI and machine learning in general. So I'm sort of adjacent to the field rather than really working in it. And my question is sort of about the idea of error propagation. So if we think about these big data methods and how they're probabilistic and how they're statistical and you know they're really sort of for making these decisions with a ton of data and not much time, we can imagine that works very well for a business context or maybe even for a policy context. But I'm really thinking about it when it comes to, to research, particularly research in the sciences where you know, I have some concerns about um, accuracy and sort of particular uh, values being, being discovered or represented rather than sort of this uh, more probable. And of course, a lot of science is probabilistic too, but I guess my question is, how can we avoid the danger, or if it is even a danger, of error propagation? So for instance, if you Xerox something and then Xerox the copy and then Xerox the copy with that corresponding loss of quality each time, the more that we aggregate and the more that we you know, develop tools that are based off another aggregation and based off another aggregation, uh, I, I worry that we're sort of losing accuracy, even if we maintain the appearance of precision. So can you comment on that? Yeah, that's very interesting, actually. Um, it, it, it depends on the perspective there, because uh, from a purely statistical perspective, you could argue, depending how the data is used, right, and exactly what estimation is done from, from the data, you could kind of argue the opposite, right? That and in fact that's that's the position that is taken in some areas in you know in AI and robotics and so forth, uh, which is that if you accumulate enough data, the local errors in the data are going to you know kind of be averaged out, right? Uh, so and so in that case you get you get a better and better model, in fact, right? Now that makes a couple of assumptions. That makes the assumption that there's no a uh, systematic error or bias or something in the data. That also makes the assumption that the processing, let's say a deep learning algorithm or something, uh, uh, actually does what I just said, averages data, instead of locking on to some artifacts of the, of the data. Um, so I think the, uh, um, the, the key ingredient that is, that is missing here, uh, and in fact across the board in a AI on ML, uh, is to have tools of models or theories that understand more deeply. If I have this uh, data set here, uh, if I now perturb that data set in a certain way, okay, how is my model perturbed, right? Uh, and that's basically kind of uh, what you would call an error propagation model, right? Uh, and this is really important, um, not just for what you said of the error propagation, this is also really important to understand how the model that I have learned on this particular data set, and again, I'm referring more of purely machine learning approaches, right? How is this model that I've learned on this particular data set going to transfer properly to now my task or my domain, right? Which is not exactly the same as this uh, data set, right? So there is all this, um, issue of understanding the, uh, the um, uh, effect of disturbances, if you will, in, in the data, uh, that is uh, still to be, uh, to be worked out. We, we have tools from this, from statistics, of course, but they make very uh, a strict assumption on the data on how it's used. Right? If, if we're within those assumptions, then there, there are good statistical tools to, to do this kind of analysis. But once we get into black box machine learning things, you know, deep learning things and all that, those, those assumptions disappear, right? And we don't know anymore this, this kind of data perturbation uh, effects, right? 
And that was a long-winded answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, sorry. I realized I didn't unmute myself. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. That's a, like, in fact, very, like, a very interesting uh, topic. And in fact, we do have a speaker tomorrow, uh, William Thompson, to talk about the error propagation, yeah. um, the data set, data decay. Yeah. So any other questions? Um, I guess this question is related to maybe all of us in one way or another. Um, so related to the pandemic. Um, so, you know, the COVID has changed the AI applications in many areas of research technology and um, all, all, all areas of life, I would say. Um, so Marshall, do you see like how the uh, COVID has changed our way of using data, interacting data with data or think about data. Um, and so do you see, I know there are a lot of challenges here, but do you see any opportunities moving forward with, to learn yeah, from so, COVID? Yeah, well, so I, I think it, it really um, emphasized, uh, if, if, if we did not think about that enough before, it certainly emphasized the uh, the importance of uh, data sharing and data reuse. And also one thing that uh, it emphasized maybe further than other application is the, um, uh, the, the, the fast pace that is necessary uh, in this case, right? There is not the luxury of, um, you know, uh, taking the time of, uh, you know, curating data and, and um, looking in more details as error propagation and things like this. Uh, th there is kind of a, a, an urgency that kind of uh, motivates uh, looking at different ways of, of using the, uh, of looking at data, um, looking at ways of, of extracting information from, uh, from the data, even though we don't have the, um, uh, how can I say, uh, all the elements all the time to extract the information that we want. So the, the Delphi project is, is an example of that, right? They're trying to do, um, you know, continuous uh, updates and, and, and prediction, right? Uh, which is very different from uh, other applications where uh, you can uh, basically get the data, do the processing, do the results and so forth in, in a much uh, larger time, uh, time constant. Mm -hmm. So I think this this more uh, how to deal with with this more uh, immediate loop of uh, processing and prediction uh, is uh, something that that uh, is probably uh, interesting. It's not unique to COVID, of course, but uh, I think it's happening and it's on on a large scale uh, for critical application that's motivating uh, kind of new thinking on on how to use data. Thank you, Marshall. I think we're running out of time, but just a, one more question from the audience. Um, do you have any thoughts on how to uh, prepare today's PhD students for tomorrow's data handling? Thanks to Alicia for asking that question. Yeah, so I think at a high level, uh, at kind of a non-technical level, it goes back to uh, Keith's uh, uh, question about uh, interdisciplinary uh, aspects. Uh, is to really expose uh, students to a wide range of data, right? Data, so if you, uh, data does not mean just uh, scientific data, it does not mean just uh, human generated data. It means, you know, there's a lot of, of different uh, types of data and they, are, they, they lead to very, very different uh, technical uh, challenges. Um, and like in, in, actually it's not unique to this topic, but, uh, you know, it's it's always the most important thing to to have a sense coming in of the of the range of, of the field, right? Uh, the biggest mistake that we that we can do uh, is to um, uh, narrow down uh, data to one's uh, to, to to one's field. I mean, I'll tell you the example in my, in my field. You know, in uh, specifically in computer vision, right? Uh, we have a um, or we've had for a long time. Uh, a very uh, restricted uh, view of what it means, uh, what data means, which is basically, you know, uh, matrix matrices and vectors of numbers, and that's it, right? Uh, and so having a much deeper understanding of, of how um, 
uh, of the, the different uh, style of, of data uh, is, is critical, I think. And I mean, an appreciation of that is, is critical for, for very early on. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall, for sharing the, uh, your thoughts with us. And thanks for audience for asking all the questions. Uh, so now, um, I guess we are having a break. Let's come back at um, 10, uh, uh, sorry, 3.10. And in the meantime, uh, if you want to go uh, follow up with some of the questions, go to GatheredHow. See you later. See you. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you.